This episode of the Memory Palace is brought to you by Amazon Prime's exclusive Lore. It's a chilling six-episode anthology series from executive producer of The Walking Dead and an executive producer of The X-Files based on the podcast phenomenon with over 70 million downloads. Creator and narrator Aaron Mankey explores the most terrifying tales throughout history, takes a myth that is rooted in historical folklore, and twists it, exposing timeless terrors that still haunt us today. Real life can scare you to death. Watch exclusively on Amazon Prime Video this October, starting on Friday the 13th. This episode of Memory Palace is brought to you by our friends at Article, makers of fine furniture with fantastic industrial and mid-century and Scandinavian designs. Also the makers of The Lamp that is lighting this script as I read it. They have everything you need at Article for your home, including brand new, a whole array of fine leather couches. These are really beautiful, extraordinarily well-made, just like everything they've got. And for $49, they will ship anything, including a large, beautiful leather couch to your front door, regardless of size. And you can get $50 off your first order of $100 or more at article.com slash memory palace. That's article.com slash memory palace. This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. Bradford Gilbert had spent his career close to the ground. At 23, he took a job as the architect for the New York Lake Erie and Western Railroad. It was 1878. The Western was basically just Western New York and just left of Lake Erie, where Gilbert walked ridges and dells, mapped its contours and calculated its slopes and rises, built bridges and trestles and new ways to go over the river and through the woods, new routes for coming around mountains. As an older man, he would redesign Grand Central Station, but his early 20s saw him designing less grand buildings in less central locations, in Avon, in Hornellsville in Oyster Bay and Tom's River in Essex Falls. The places you waited to get places where things actually happened. But buy a ticket there for Manhattan or St. Louis and you could see other architects building more impressive things. You could disembark and marvel at six and eight and ten story structures. Mammoth buildings of stone and brick and wrought iron holding court on whole city blocks like medieval fortresses made for the kings of the modern American insurance industry, the emperors of imports and exports. One of these was looking to expand his empire. John Noble Stearns had made a lot of money importing silk, and he was looking to make a lot more in real estate. He bought some land in a prime location at 50 Broadway. It was the perfect place for a new office building, right downtown near the ports, in the heart of the growing financial industry. But there was a problem. The lot was less than 22 feet wide. There are rules that dictate what you can build and how. Rules of physics and rules of men who sit on various bureaucratic boards and bodies. And those rules dictated that if Stearns wanted to build one of those 10-story office towers that were all the rage in 1888, he would need to build walls of stone and brick that were 5 feet thick, with itty-bitty windows. And that left room for an interior that was only 11 feet wide. Slice off a few feet for a hallway, a few for a bathroom, a couple for a coat closet, another for some filing cabinets and an umbrella stand. And he would be asking the quintessential modern titan of American industry to work in a dark cell, better suited for a monk illuminating a manuscript. Stearns asked all the best architects for a solution. They had built medieval bell towers come Manhattan Bank headquarters. They had made midtown hotels that looked like mountain fortresses. But what Stearns wanted was a flagstaff. What Stearns wanted was a blade of grass. And they weren't in the blade of grass building business. They told them it couldn't be done. Everyone except Bradford Gilbert. The in-house architect for the New York, Lake Erie, and Western Railroad had an idea. Even the simplest train trip between two of his backwater stations often required stunning feats of engineering. Hundreds of tons of cars and cargo hurtle over thin trestles and bridges every day. What if he turned one of those bridges on its head? What if he used one of those steel frames that so capably carry trains and built it up instead of out? He told Stearns that if he did this, the walls wouldn't have to be five feet thick. They could be nine inches. And in the 20-foot wide office spaces that that would create... The quintessential modern titan of American industry would have room to stretch out his legs. 
while he made out his rent check to John Noble Stearns. They would call it the Tower Building. Stearns loved the idea. For a while. Until people started telling him it was completely bananas. First he heard it from business associates, people looking out for his investment. Then it was the press, which called the project and the men behind it idiotic. Architects came in from all over the country to watch the tower building rise, to pore over Gilbert's blueprints. And they all pretty much agreed. Gilbert and Stearns were idiots. The walls were just too thin. The foundation was too narrow. Sure, those quintessentially modern men could stretch out their legs in sunny, 20-foot-wide offices stacked up like cardboard boxes. But they could also be crushed to death when the first stiff wind came and blew the building down. Stearns asked Gilbert to change the plans. And he refused. He said he was so confident in his design that he would move his offices to the top two floors of the building. If the building blew down, he would have the farthest to fall and the longest time to consider his mistakes before he slammed into the pavement. The first stiff winds of a hurricane blew into Manhattan on a Sunday morning in 1889. The tower building stood, nearly complete, and people lined the streets to watch it tumble. By late morning, the crowd numbered in the hundreds, the curious, the morbid, the newspaper men who were professionally both. And as the wind roared, a man pushed through the crowd. He walked to the base of the tower, to a construction ladder, and began to climb. When Bradford Gilbert reached the top of his tower, the wind whipped through its skeleton frame at more than 80 miles an hour. It was too strong for him to stand in the girders that crossed in the center of what he hoped would someday be his penthouse office. It was too strong to look down at the crowd, who were probably placing bets on whether he would die by being blown off the building or simply in the crushing force of its collapse. But he crawled out to the center of the building and pulled from a bag a rope with a lead weight attached to one end. He tied the other end to a girder and tossed the weight down through the empty floors below. And when he got to the ground, he looked up and saw the lead weight hanging in midair, stock still, held up by a building that wasn't going anywhere. The next day, the papers called Gilbert an idiot, and this time he probably deserved it. They admitted his idea was genius. And for years after... Gilbert could sit in his penthouse office in the tower building and he could look out of his large window, stretch out his legs, and watch a whole city stretching ever higher as it took his idea and built on it. 